React Native has unlocked native mobile development to web engineers who may now apply their skills to build iOS and Android applications in JavaScript. For the first time, cross-platform JavaScript-based applications feel as if they were written in the native language of choice for the platforms. Businesses who choose to adopt React Native for their native app development also see great benefits, such as the ability to push new JavaScript code without going through the App Store review process, and the ability to share code and business behaviors across the iOS and Android platforms. Expo is building a cross-platform native runtime for React Native. Expo brings the benefits of deployment and iterative development to native without sacrificing any user experience costs. Expo plans to do this with their native SDK, their custom development environment, and tools built in collaboration with Facebook, like Create React Native App, which is discussed in today's episode. React Native has the incredible potential to revolutionize all user interface development with its core set of cross-platform UI primitives and React's popular declarative rendering pattern. So, in this episode, Brent Votney and Adam Perry join Caleb Meredith to discuss Expo and the future of React Native and try to answer the question, can React Native become the one UI framework to rule them all? For more than 30 years, DNS has been one of the fundamental protocols of the internet. Yet, despite its accepted importance, it has never quite gotten the due that it deserves. But today's dynamic applications, hybrid clouds, and volatile internet demand that you rethink the strategic value and importance of your DNS choices. Oracle Dyn provides DNS that is as dynamic and intelligent as your applications. Dyn DNS gets your users to the right cloud service, the right CDN, or the right data center using intelligent response to steer traffic based on business policies as well as real-time internet conditions like the security and the performance of the network path. Dyn maps all internet pathways every 24 seconds via more than 500 million trace routes. This is the equivalent of 7 light years of distance, or 1.7 billion times around the circumference of the Earth. With over 10 years of experience supporting the likes of Netflix, Twitter, Zappos, Etsy, and Salesforce, Dyn can scale to meet the demand of the largest web applications. Get started with a free 30-day trial for your application by going to dyn.com slash sedaily. That's D-Y-N dot com slash S-E daily. After the free trial, Dyn's developer plans start at just $7 a month for world-class DNS. Rethink DNS. Go to Dyn dot com slash S-E daily to learn more and get your free trial of Dyn DNS. I'm here with Brent Vatney and Adam Perry, who work on Expo, a framework that helps JavaScript developers build native iOS and Android applications. Brent and Adam, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thanks for having us. All right, so first I want to talk about Expo. We have had many cross-platform tools that allow developers to write web apps that can be used as a mobile app. Is the application experience of a web app so different than a mobile app that there is a tension that cannot be resolved in some of these previous cross-platform tools? I could take that one. So I think that there are a few things that maybe need to be discussed about the differences between some of the other solutions that are available for the same problem and whether or not the approach of taking web applications and making them into web applica- or rather mobile applications is a viable uh, strategy. So I think that some of the other solutions that have existed before have been in many ways trying out ideas and proving concepts that ultimately led to React Native and something like Expo uh, as a result of that. So things like Titanium, which kind of, as far as I know, were the first ones to pioneer the idea of having some app code running in JavaScript and then sending these updates over the bridge in order to update some native UI. So this was 
kind of uh, a concept that existed well before React Native itself. Even through Cordova or PhoneGap, there was a way to communicate over the Cordova bridge, which was admittedly much more simplistic, but, but the same sort of idea where you have some app code running in this language that's shared across platforms that then sends some commands over to a native side in order to either call into APIs that, such as open the camera or, or even APIs like create a view and position it here on the screen. So this is something that, that I think, yeah, has just sort of grown over time. As for whether or not web applications can, are, are sort of fundamentally at odds with the idea of creating sort of a mobile application, I don't think that is necessarily true. I just think that with the current state of tools that exist for the web, it's just, it's very difficult and you kind of hit a ceiling at some point where you just can't take the UI any further. You can't handle gestures any better. You can't do it in a, a cross-platform way due to a lot of discrepancies around how different br browsers handle certain events or support or don't support different things. So it's, it's less of an idea of it not being sort of theoretically possible and more, I think that it's just not practically possible right now, mm. if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, yeah, of course it does. <laughs> so React Native is an incredible tool that solves a lot of these problems and ultimately empowers web developers to build applications for iOS and Android that feel as if they were written in the native language for the platform because of bridge technologies, right? So mm -hmm. what aspects of React Native make it difficult to use and therefore warrant Expo's existence? Adam, yeah, do you want to take this one? I think it's, yeah. So I think there's there are a number of kind of categories of problems that people run into when using React Native kind of on its own without, without using Expo's tools. Most of them are in some way related to the effort required to configure, build, and manage updates to the native code in a React Native project. So, you know, it, when you compare like the iteration cycle of React Native to the web, once you've gotten up and running with React Native, it tends to be quite strong, but there are just a number of headaches associated with getting to that point where you can be iterating quickly on your UI. So some of these things are just like initial setup problems, Xcode and Android Studio, especially for beginners, are really difficult to wrangle. But then even for experts, there are ongoing issues with like tracking the stability of React Native's native header files and APIs for accessing the bridge. So keeping you know whatever set of open source native modules you're relying on up to date and in sync with your project can be quite a challenge for, for a lot of teams. And finally, you know, writing your own native modules to begin with is, you know, it's not nearly as well documented right now, at least, compared to the like JavaScript APIs, like the, the, the training, the tooling, and the culture around React Native are very much focused on like working in JavaScript. And so it can be very difficult when developers want some native primitive available to them, but don't have like the expertise or bandwidth or resources to like drop down to that native code and, and build their own, their own native APIs. And so like a number of these problems are ones that we attempt to solve at Expo. We provide uh, like a curated set of native modules that, you know, we're, we're growing that list and trying to, trying to offer the primitives that people can work with in JavaScript so they don't have to drop down to, to native code. And we also handle like all of the native build and configuration as part of the Expo client app that loads your JavaScript directly. So you don't have to manage or configure or manage updates to this the, the native part of your React Native application. So what are some of the native modules Expo provides to its users? Uh, we have uh, a whole lot, actually. So they range from like more or less what you'd expect, like an image picker API that's cross-platform. I, I should mention also that, that cross-platform APIs is something we prioritize so that developers don't often have to worry about the platform differences. We also have like GPS and video, and we're building on an audio API right now. And we also have some slightly more exotic things. We have a very interesting and novel OpenGL implementation that's compatible with WebGL. So like you can use 3JS inside of Expo and it works as it would on the web, but it like is fundamentally operating directly on the native OpenGL APIs. Uh, and we have a whole list on, on the Expo documentation. Yeah, I think another, a few more are worth highlighting there because just going back to your original explanation, one of the key things about Expo, I think, is that 
it just makes you productive kind of out of the box as soon as possible. Whereas when you're just mm -hmm. using React Native on its own, there's a lot of overhead for learning how to configure an Xcode or Android project, for how to get it somewhere where you can actually share it with your teammates or other stakeholders, all sorts of things like that. And, and so part of this is, you know, we've identified there are things that people just need for most apps. Some of these are Facebook login, for example, or Google login. And then we also just provide a generic wrapper around some platform specific modal web browsers. So going a little bit into detail about the APIs, there's it's called SF Safari View Controller on iOS and custom Chrome tabs on Android. And what that does is shares cookies with your actual browser app so that you're able to easily implement OAuth and things like maps, which are very common. And so these are all sorts of things that you you can in the, for the most part just install in an existing or rather a new React Native app that that doesn't use Expo, but it just adds on all of this work involved with actually figuring out which one you should use out of these libraries that exist in the ecosystem, keeping it up to date with everything, the various kinds of configuration that are involved with that. That it turns out if you're coming from a web background, it can be pretty overwhelming when you need to start off a new project and, and add all of these things in. And, and learn so much at once. So we're just hoping to make the experience ultimately a lot more like web development, where you just create an app and mm -hmm. load it into this client and start working on it, and you have the APIs that you need to build your app available to you right away. Yeah, so that, that's, that's mm -hmm. I think, some of it pretty well. Yeah, I think one, one other piece, in addition to like the developer tooling, the native modules, that I would add is that we have, you know, we're building out a number of services to make it significantly easier for people to like leverage actual native specific technology. We're not, you know, shooting for parity mm -hmm. with with web applications, but we have a push notification service where, you know, you interact mm -hmm. through JavaScript with our API or mm -hmm. with the notifications that are coming onto the device rather. And you have, you know, full control there. And we also have, you know, like build services so that when you want to publish like to the app and play stores, you just, you know, it's a few commands on your command line and you have like an IPA file to download and upload mm -hmm. to iTunes Connect, which really streamlines the process for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. and just one follow-up to that. So in case we missed anything here, yeah. you can check out on Stack Overflow. We've answered this question mm -hmm. and it's uh, probably phrased much more eloquently than what we've managed to uh, put yeah. together <laughs> on, yeah. on the spot. So yeah, check that yeah. out. <laughs> no, no, I think you explained it uh, quite well. Yeah, the, having those primitives are especially useful for JavaScript developers who are not familiar with the web platform. But, yeah. you know, saying that, one of the real powers of React Native is that even though it allows you to primarily write your app in JavaScript, is that when the JavaScript is perhaps too slow or you need a native API that Expo or React Native doesn't provide, you can jump down to that lower level and write a native module. Mm -hmm. Now, Expo provides a bunch of native modules on its own, but it also discourages users from writing their own native modules or bringing in custom native modules from the NPM ecosystem that aren't available in Expo. So why would Expo discourage this functionality? So I think the main reason for discouraging it is just that it limits a lot of the services that can be provided around, around Expo. So things like handling your builds for you or having an easy way to immediately, as soon as you create the app, share the URL with somebody on the other side of the world so that they can load your app up and live reload as it's happening. You know, the, these sorts of things are only possible when you have a shared native runtime. And, and as we've seen with the web, there are quite a few things that you can do once, that, once you have this shared native runtime, essentially, which is really what the web APIs are. So we discourage that because we think that there are a lot of benefits to, to having that. That said, I, I think in, in practice, there are cases where, uh, especially as React Native is still two years old or so and an Expo mm -hmm. around the same age, you're going to run into to cases where you kind of will need to, in some cases, bridge a native API. And so what we've done is we made it possible for you to, you can either call it eject kind of in the context of uh, create React app or create React Native app, or call it, we like to call it detach within the context of, of Expo itself. Feel free to read the documentation for more information on, on mm. why that is. But what it does essentially is it generates iOS and Android projects for you, where normally with Expo you just have JavaScript files, but when you run this command, it generates the iOS and Android projects and links 
the Expo native SDK so that you're then free to add whatever native code that you like to the project. Of course, you lose out on a lot of the benefits of having the shared native runtime, but if it's absolutely required, then it's definitely a possibility. Yeah, shared native runtime is a great way of describing it. So do you think Expo is the best choice for building Greenfield React Native apps, or will large apps inevitably eventually bring in their own custom native modules and eventually ditch Expo with it? I think that if you know right out of the box that you're going to need some custom native module, like maybe you're making a video chat kind of app or you are planning on using Bluetooth and you know someday we, we plan on having support for those APIs. But at the moment, you, you kind of just have to look at what's available through, as we call it, Expo Kit, which is this native SDK that you get when you detach and see whether that includes other things that you need or if it's worth just starting from scratch with the plain React Native project. I think in many cases, there is no downside to just starting out with Expo. And if you hit a wall, you can just detach and continue on as if you had started from nothing before with, with a plain React Native project. So, yeah, and that's the that's path that I would probably plug myself. I, I think there's, at this point, with, with Expo Kit maturing, there's very, very little downside to yeah. doing some initial UI prototyping and you know, like starting work within Expo just because it's so so fast to get running. And you know, you just you don't have to worry about a number of new project setup elements. Yeah, yeah. It's there's, a, there's always the escape hatch. Yeah, it's important to emphasize as well that we don't lock you in in any way. You're free to take your code anywhere, use our native SDKs. It's all open source. So, you know, by starting off, there's not really, like like Adam said, there's not really much of a downside to to doing it that way. And there's a lot of upside in that you can just get going without having to think about a lot of these details that maybe you don't even need to think about yet on your project. Hmm. Okay. Every software project uses email. Every time an e-commerce site processes a transaction or a user makes a comment on a social network, email notifications are sent. SparkPost provides email delivery services for apps and websites. To try SparkPost and send 100,000 emails a month for free, go to pages.sparkpost.com slash sedaily. SparkPost has a range of pricing options, from free self-service packages to sophisticated enterprise support and services. Start sending emails to your users today. Go to pages.sparkpost.com slash sedaily to send 100,000 emails a month for free. Thanks to SparkPost for being a new sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. And if you want to send 100,000 emails a month for free, go to pages.sparkpost.com slash sedaily. So next, I want to talk a bit about Create React Native App. So at ReactConf 2017, Expo announced a new project, Create React Native App. What was the need you saw in the React Native ecosystem, and I guess in the Expo ecosystem, that led you to build Create React Native App? Yeah, so we we had some conversations with some folks at Facebook who work on React Native open source, and kind of the the product of these conversations was that it would be really fantastic if there was a way to make use of a number of Expos like high points the 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 qualities that make developing on top of Expo really wonderful without having to depend directly on like our back end services mm-hmm. and you know like our our services offer a number of very useful things to developers but when it comes to you know a getting started experience for a technology, there was definitely a gap for something that had the ease of use of the Expo client without having to go through like account registration and reading a lot of documentation. And there's also in the React community at large um, on the web and on native, been a lot of praise heaped on Create React App. It's provided an excellent model for a CLI for React projects, something that React projects were you know, the, the community hadn't really rallied around a standard. There were some attempts at, at doing it well, but there, there was not anything that was kind of the de facto tool to use and create React app 
as far as I can tell, has has become that default. And so it's a very familiar model to developers who want to work mm. with React. And there's there's also some like nice benefits as an implementer of a tool when, when you're doing it the way that Create React App does. But that's kind of mm. getting into the weeds a little. And so ultimately, we identified a lot of work that would be necessary to make Expo play well with you know, no service dependency and with like the vanilla JavaScript that runs React Native normally. We Expo projects, you know, we it's very slim. There's not very much different in it, but historically have we've used a fork to make sure that we can offer like the best experience possible. And so there was a lot of work that went into into these elements to make it make sure that create React Native app was like a polished way for people to get started with React Native in general without having to like mm-hmm. also at the same time take the plunge on buying into Expo's model. Yeah, I I think it's really important to emphasize from that the getting started process for React Native without using Create React Native app can take up to hours depending on your internet connection and and what you have installed already. You have to install Xcode and the command line tools and various other things. And so a metric that was really important for that that some of these open source folks at Facebook were, were considering was what is the time to hello world? And... Before create React Native app, the time to hello world, like I say, could be could be hours, which is, you know, too damn long, <laughs> frankly. So, <laughs> so with create React Native app, one of the main objectives was we want to get this startup time, this time to hello world, down to the minimal amount of time that we can possibly do. And this is an ongoing effort as we're improving various tools and removing dependencies. And uh, but at this point, it's you know it's pretty pretty straightforward. If you have an iPhone and you have a Windows PC, you can install a couple of programs and essentially get started within five or ten minutes, if not less. So it's it's a significant improvement and and you know opens the door to development for devices like iPhones mm-hmm. on on Linux and and Windows where that wasn't mm-hmm. previously mm-hmm. possible mm-hmm. using the the model suggested in in the react native documentation thank yeah. you for so providing just the context for an, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm, in, I'm in too deep <laughs> <laughs> yeah and just to provide context really quickly to our audience we're talking about create react app and create react native app so create react app is a web version and create react native app is for ios and android so yeah, yeah. the names are similar it can be a little confusing i i just want to make sure uh, that clarification's out there so um Definitely. What I'm hearing from you is Create React Native App was Facebook's idea? I wouldn't say it was entirely their mm-hmm. idea. I mean, I think it's difficult to, like, attribute that when it's the product yeah, of, yeah, of course. kind of an ongoing conversation. You know, I've been the main committer on the tool itself, but we've mm-hmm. been working on the Expo side on a bunch of things. And we've had help from Eric Vicente and Martin Konacek on making sure that upstream things happen to provide a smooth process to transition from create react native app to like you know using the full react native cli it's definitely been a, a, a good collaboration i think okay so let's so the name of create react native app as we you know discussed previously was inspired by create react app yes. so what is create react app and how is create react native app similar if you could go into more detail on that Definitely. So Create React App is it's a command line tool for, strictly speaking, Create React App is it's a command line tool for initializing React projects. And it does this using this other, this other NPM package called React Scripts. And mm-hmm. basically the way that works is Create React App itself is completely stable. Users don't have to upgrade the global command line tool. And this stable global command line tool downloads an up-to-date scripts package. And the scripts package contains all of the build and tooling configuration for like this default React project. And so that includes like CSS and JavaScript bundling and includes like Babel configurations. It also includes a just testing config. So users have Mm -hmm. a, uh, a testing config out of the box. It includes a fantastic user guide on how to like extend your React application with things like flow type analysis and and other like kind of other things you might want to include in your project. And so this this model for Create React App um, it enables a few things. I think if you talked to like the maintainers and creators of Create React App, they would have 
a number of other positives. But basically, it means that users don't have to update their tooling globally uh, on a regular basis. And so tooling is configured per project. It also essentially has the effect of hiding complexity from the user until they're prepared to like face Webpack configuration on their own, right? And so it, it bundles all of these kind of best practices for React applications under this scripts package that it, that it installs for you. And so we have a very similar model for create React Native app. You know, at, this is not something new to the world. We saw it working very, very well for create React app and basically just went the same route. So we have a React Native scripts package, and this includes a number of tools, both from React Native and some stuff we've built to Expo to kind of smooth out a few things that enables users to run all of their build commands for their project from the configuration that's just this one single dependency that they have in their project. We're not quite as well abstracted as Create React App yet. There are a couple mm -hmm. of points where we don't have programmatic control over certain things like Babel configuration the way that you do mm -hmm. with Webpack. And so mm -hmm. there's ongoing work to like fully encapsulate all of that build and tooling configuration. So we're not there yet. But we've managed mm -hmm. to get, I think, the the bulk of what a user would normally be confronted with if configuring all of this themselves mm -hmm. and essentially hide it in this package. So they just have to update a couple of developer dependencies in order to like keep their build tooling current with the ecosystem. Hmm. Yep. Okay. And it, it's important to stress that create React app was incredibly important to the React web ecosystem because yeah. before create React app, as you mentioned, everything that create React app does, you'd have to do manually before you could even set up a project. So this would you know, lead to hours of frustration before you could even start hacking on an app. And so Absolutely. create React app made starting a React web app much, much simpler. Is create React native app saving as much frustration for React native developers, especially when we consider that the cost of setting up a React native project is mostly a one-time cost to install Xcode and Android Studio and after that, you know, starting a React Native project is pretty easy. So is Create React Native app saving as much frustration? That depends on which developer you talk to. Mm -hmm. You're right to mm -hmm. identify that the React Native CLI has definitely done a lot of the work for React Native that Create React app did for, for React DOM, right? Or rather yes. React for the web. So Create React Native app is, I think you could, from, from one perspective, if you're an existing mobile developer, Create React Native app is kind of closing that last mile, right? Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. I think there's another group of developers that we would really love to see in the React Native ecosystem for whom the native dependencies were kind of just a, a deal breaker for trying things out. And that's like existing web developers and people new to, to software development. And basically anyone who hasn't dealt with Xcode or anyone who owns an iPhone but not a Mac because mm -hmm. you know, for a React Native CLI project, you have to have a Mac if you want to develop for iOS. And so I think you know, it's, it's important not to downplay the existing amount of work that went into React Native CLI and its template projects and its scripts. I think you're, you're absolutely right to identify how easy that is to do once you've gotten all of the, the build configuration started. But I also think that, that these people who just were not a part of the community before and who might have a chance to, to get involved and at least try things out it is big. I also think that, and there's been some work elsewhere on this problem, but upgrading React Native versions has historically mm -hmm. been mm -hmm. challenging. There's been work on this React Native Git upgrade tool, which I have not played with as much as I would like to and as, as much as I probably should have, but that's, you know, it aims to essentially use like Git merge technology to help with upgrading your React Native version, especially when it comes to like your custom native dependencies. But this is something that is, for the most part, abstracted away for you when you're using Create mm -hmm. React Native App and by extension when you're using Expo. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's also a significant uh, a significant boon to existing React Native developers if they, if they were to try it out. Yeah, certainly. And the being able to develop iOS on Windows is, is definitely on the... Mm -hmm. a key seller there. And yeah. uh, you might have mentioned this already, but is being able to develop iOS on Android or on Windows or mm -hmm. Linux, is that exclusive to create React Native app or, you know, does Expo, vanilla Expo provide that functionality as well? Oh yeah. So it's, it's possible in create React Native app because we load your project in the Expo client. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is enabled by the same underlying technology, which enables 
cross-platform development on the Expo uh, toolkit. Mm -hmm. Well, could you could you develop iOS on Windows with just the Expo toolkit? Absolutely. Sorry, I didn't answer your okay. question directly enough. I apologize. Yeah. Okay. I, I think right, another thing that, that's worth pointing out about this is, although currently the the only way to open a create React Native app project on your phone is with the Expo client, there's no reason why it has to remain that way. Anybody can really build their own client that can open a create React Native app project. And it would be really interesting to see other people kind of work on that and see what people come up with. So there's an mm -hmm. app JSON file which defines the configuration for various things, like what icon to show on the loading screen or various things related to, let's say, push notifications and, and whatnot. So this is all under the namespace currently of Expo. So if you open app JSON, you'll see curly braces, and then at the top level there will be an Expo key, and then the configuration that lives under that is specific to Expo, but you could imagine there being another key, maybe software engineering daily, and then you have your own <laughs> client for create React Native app. And th there's nothing really stopping that from, from being the case. And yeah, it would be really interesting to see that happen. <laughs> that would be fun. We could download episodes in the background yeah. or something. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So next, I, um, I want to talk a bit about React Native on other platforms. So React Native is not limited to just iOS and Android development, but may theoretically target any platform where JavaScript may run. Some other platforms built for React Native today include one for the Windows Phone, virtual reality, and ironically, the web. Do you foresee React Native becoming a popular framework for building on other platforms than iOS and Android? Well, actually, it's worth pointing out that even the, the Windows implementation is not just for Windows Phone, but it's for the universal Windows platform. So it runs on HoloLens, mm. it runs on Xboxes or desktop. And so it's pretty much anything that runs, I believe it's from Windows 10 or higher. It's the API is considered universal Windows platform. Someone I'm sure mm. will correct me on that, which is fine. But to go back to the original question, yeah, I think we're seeing this, and we, we have been seeing it kind of for a couple of years now. It doesn't necessarily have to be you know, a, a mobile device or, or some new medium. It can be something that we've been using for years and, and kind of a different approach on how to write a UI for it. And so at React Conf this year, someone mentioned, I think it was Dustin Kasten, React Blessed, so you can write kind of terminal UIs using React. They even used React Motion to create animations in that context, which was pretty interesting. There, there are other things. He, he, I think Dustin also built React hardware, um, so you can use React to control Arduinos and, and that type of thing. Yeah, I think ultimately that what React has going for it in, in this space is that the UI that you define, or, or rather the, the virtual DOM that you define through JSX, really isn't tied to any underlying implementation. And you can quite easily implement these renderers that do completely different things than what you would do in the context of a web browser or a native app. And as far as I can tell, one of the more interesting approaches to, to having kind of a, a cross-platform configuration and declarative, I guess in some cases, logic or, or mm -hmm. UI that's, that's out there. Uh, Ken Wheeler has also done some pretty interesting stuff around that. I believe he's going to give a talk soon about powering a crossbow with React. I have no idea what that means, but I guess we'll find out. <laughs> yeah, I guess we will. At Software Engineering Daily, we need to keep our metrics reliable. If a botnet started listening to all of our episodes and we had nothing to stop it, our statistics would be corrupted. We would have no way to know whether a listen came from a bot or from a real user. That's why we use Encapsula to stop attackers and improve performance. When a listener makes a request to play an episode of Software Engineering Daily, Encapsula checks that request before it reaches our servers and filters bot traffic, preventing it from ever reaching us. Botnets and DDoS attacks are not just a threat to podcasts. They can impact your application too. Encapsula can protect your API servers and your microservices from responding to unwanted requests. To try Encapsula for yourself, go to encapsula.com slash sedaily and get a month of Encapsula for free. Encapsula's API gives you control over the security and performance of your application. Whether you have a complex microservices architecture or a WordPress site, 
like Software Engineering Daily. Encapsula has a global network of over 30 data centers that optimize routing and cache your content. The same network of data centers that is filtering your content for attackers is operating as a CDN and speeding up your application. To try Encapsula today, go to encapsula.com slash sedaily and check it out. Thanks again, Encapsula. But do you think, so React Native has become, uh, I guess you could say, a popular framework on iOS and Android. Do you think it could also become popular on something like the universal Windows platform? Yeah, I think so. And I, I think that the label of React Native is probably going to go away. I think it will mm. just be React, mm-hmm. and there'll be sort of React iOS and React Android and, and whatnot. But there's been a lot of work, and, and I think that the universal Windows platform implementation of, of React Native is not only maturing relatively quickly and, and gaining kind of mainstream acceptance within Microsoft itself, which we saw by having the mm. repository being moved from the React Windows organization to the official Microsoft organization on GitHub uh, recently. Mm-hmm. But there there's a lot of work going on to try and keep parity with the iOS and Android versions of React Native, which is no small task considering that there is a much smaller group of people who are working on on, on the UWP React Native platform. So yeah, I, I really think that as long as you know work continues on that, there, I mean, it, it's kind of a limiting factor in that most people use React Native specifically for mobile UIs at the moment or mobile apps. And of course, Windows Phone isn't quite as popular as maybe it once was or could be. So yeah, it really depends on what people start to use it for, but I could, I could absolutely see that becoming more mainstream. So you mentioned that you thought maybe eventually the the native label would just disappear and um, you know just become React. So what happens to what we classically think about React? You know the the JavaScript library that does the reconciliation between mm-hmm. the virtual DOM trees. So what happens to that library if React Native becomes React? <laughs> I think it's it's pretty similar to what's already been happening over the last couple of years, where you know Re- React DOM itself was pulled out of the, the core React library, and mm-hmm. um, I think there might still be some vestiges of, of React DOM itself in the core, but I, I think we just kind of see these different renderers becoming their own packages that mm-hmm. you use in conjunction with the core library that's responsible for yeah, doing, doing this underlying reconciliation and, and, and whatnot. Do you think Create React App will eventually use React Native under the hood? <laughs> use- <laughs> I would I mean... The future in which that happens is so far off that it's very <laughs> difficult to predict. I think mm-hmm. there's, mm-hmm. you know, there's about five million sequential events that would have to happen before. <laughs> before that. <laughs> yeah, so, I, now I'm, I'm not sure about that. Whether whether it will happen or whether it's desirable, I think it would be amazing if if that were to happen. I would love to see more yeah. convergence between React DOM and what we currently call React Native. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that that would be incredible. There's mm-hmm. a lot of opportunities for that. Nicholas Gallagher at Twitter has done a lot of work on React Native Web and is continuing to push forward with that. Leland Richardson, who works at Airbnb, has a similar library called React Primitives, which is pushing for that. Ultimately, the, you know, I was saying earlier that the the platforms really there's no reason why, I guess theoretically speaking, that web applications could not also be mobile applications. As we see more convergence there, I think it'll it'll make this a lot easier. But also as React Native matures and in many ways is becoming more spec compliant with the web APIs that it uses, for example, with Flexbox, yeah. which is, is pretty yeah. close now, it makes this kind of thing a lot easier to do. I've heard of people who are working on, on apps internally at Microsoft who one of the developers there actually rewrote the implementation of CSS layout, which is now known as Yoga, in order to get better spec compliance so that they could reuse code from iOS and Android that involved using Flexbox layout on the web as well. So, yeah, I think... Wait, wait, so... <laughs> sorry, sorry So, <laughs> Microsoft is using Yoga now? Yoga is the implementation of Flexbox and React Native. Yeah, so they actually re-implemented that also, I believe, in C-sharp for, for the okay. Universal Windows platform. And... Yeah, similarly, they're, they're using React Native on a couple of projects internally. Um, this was something, I believe it's, it's been discussed publicly, and you can actually try out a private beta of it now. There's 
the Skype preview for Android, which is built using React Native. And, and so, yeah, they're, they're really experimenting with a, a lot of things related to React Native over at Microsoft. They have their services side, which is working on the, uh, what was the name of this thing? Pasture Ram's going to kill me. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, services Azure, Center? Azure, mobile Center. Mobile Azure, Center. Azure, that's Azure mobile Center. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so this is something that is kind of end-to-end integration where it builds analytics and error reporting and all this kind of thing into your React Native project for you, along with Code Push, mm-hmm. which gives you the over-the-air updates kind of out of the box. So it's sort of, sorry, I, I guess, lost the, the thread of the original question, uh-huh. but, <laughs> but I guess I think that's also, it's I, w- I would add to kind of this general discussion that, like, in the long term, there's a lot of interesting possibilities with, like, a full-scale convergence of React DOM yeah. and React Native. But in the nearer term, regardless of, of how that the potential for that process works out, in the nearer term, there's a lot of very interesting work going into uh, improving, like the same way that React Native improves code sharing across iOS and Android for mobile teams. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of very interesting work, some of which Brent mentioned, on making it easier to abstract over the differences between DOM and the native UI layout so that mm-hmm. you can share React code yeah. and share UI components and share business logic and and these things are becoming much more a reality in the in the near term, which I think is really exciting. Just going back to the yoga thing really quickly, yeah. I want to make sure I've, I'm understanding this correctly. So Microsoft is thinking about using a Flexbox implementation originally written by Facebook in Edge when Facebook isn't even a browser company. Oh, sorry. They're not using it in Edge. They're okay. using it in, okay. in their UWP React Native implementation. All right. Okay. That would... <laughs> I'm sorry. That's, that's just how I heard it. But... <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm glad you clarified that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so the React for Virtual Reality Project, or React VR, uses React Native. Why would React Native be an attractive choice for a greenfield project like React VR? That's a good question that I don't think I have a good answer to, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. All right. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Just kind of thinking now that about it loosely. I mean, the build tooling, if, if nothing else. Yeah, I think okay. I mean I think like a, a JavaScript bridge to, to native APIs is a powerful abstraction, and yeah. when you have a robust working one, you know I I can't speak to the the motivations for for building it this way, but I can certainly sympathize with the desire to reuse that code. That seems powerful mm-hmm. to me. Mm-hmm. Okay, all right. So React started as a UI framework that only targeted the web, and we talked about this a bit earlier, but. Now it has grown to support more platforms with React Native. And ironically, one of the platforms that React Native now supports is now the web, which, you know, as, mm-hmm. as we know, Twitter is, uh, you know, some employees from Twitter are working on. So why is it attractive for React Native to support the web platform when React itself already does a good job at that? I think that a big issue with the way that the interop works right now is, I think we're not necessarily talking about, like, replacing the like React DOM package or anything like that. Uh, I think mm-hmm. a key part is on React Native and on the web, or React DOM rather, there are different components that you use to describe primitives. So on the web, you'll have a div, and in React Native, you'll have a view. And currently, if you import a view from React Native, uh, you essentially can't use that, that component that imports the view. You can't share that with the web. What React Native Web and, and React Primitives do is essentially give you this, this package that where, where you import these primitives from rather than importing them from React Native itself. And they take care of mapping the properties that are, are common or that work on the web to the appropriate properties for like a div and, and for a span mm. and whatnot. So it, it provides this layer that kind of translates between the way that React Native describes components and the way that, that React DOM describes components. So from my understanding, though, the, the mobile Twitter website uses React Native for web, you know, and it's in, in the entire app. So, but the, the Twitter iOS and Android app does not use React Native, at least yet. So Twitter is only using React Native to target the web. And so why would the mobile web Twitter team make the decision to use React Native for the web? And I do want to emphasize this is the, the mobile Twitter website and not the main Twitter website. I think that's a fair question. Um, one thing I'm not actually not entirely sure about is to what extent React Native Web is used on the mobile Twitter site. I know that Nicholas has mentioned using React Native Web and, and the way that styles are aggregated and deduped and, and whatnot and using that to build out style sheets, but I'm not sure if that's what's being used in production or not. 
maybe you have more information than me about that. So, so it's really hard to say. Uh, I think that you know, Twitter already has a lot of mobile engineers, and it's a big cultural yeah. shift to go from having native mobile engineers to now starting to integrate React Native into various parts of, of your app. And some companies are, are, are slower than others at doing it because maybe they're more cautious or have different philosophies around mobile development. We've seen that Khan Academy has only recently started to look into integrating React Native into their mobile app, despite having a team that, that involves, for example, uh, Jared Forsyth, who worked at Facebook before and worked on React Native and, and dev tools around that and, and was advocating for it for a while. So I think people just have, and, and organizations have a different tolerance and at what stage of maturity for a project they're willing to start making a big investment into it. That's, that seems to me to be likely, but uh, this is all speculation. And you should definitely have Nicholas Gallagher on the <laughs> podcast at some point to discuss Twitter yeah. and mobile. I think he'd be a great guest. Yeah, for sure. And I, I guess my only reference point is I opened up the React Dev Tools once and I saw some views. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, yeah. Well, yeah, they are using React on, on yeah. the mobile site. That's, that's, yeah. Yeah. So, do you have any other unusual or ironic examples of people using React Native? Um, I wouldn't classify it as extremely unusual, but there's been work going into the TVOS target, I believe, mm -hmm. for using Apple TV. I think there are some other uh, interesting not targets that you don't immediately think of when you think of web technologies. A lot of uh, like, I think there's been work into, I, you know, before I misspeak, I'm going to, I'm going to stop. I can't remember <laughs> what it is, but there's been some, there's been some work into TVOS yeah. and, and other kind of kiosk style technologies. Yeah. I think maybe, maybe this isn't the, a very outrageous example or, or funny example, but, but more of a serious one of, I, I was really su surprised to learn that Flipkart, which is a very large retailer in India, they actually use React Native on one of their their mobile apps for Android, which is primarily by people who have extremely low-end devices. And so they might have, at most, maybe 60 megabytes of RAM available when, when they open the app. And I think React Nav Native has a bit of a reputation for using a lot of memory. So they do all sorts mm -hmm. of optimizations around that related to list views and, and whatnot. And so I think what, what that really demonstrates is even in really harsh conditions, you can adapt React Native to, to work for, for your use case. It might take a bit of work, but that seems like it's been valuable, at least in the, in the context of Flipkart. And that's another person who would be a great podcast guest is <laughs> Pujani. I'm sorry if I'm saying the last name wrong, yeah. but he, he is a really smart guy about progressive web apps and, and React Native. So I'd definitely chat with him further about that. OK. So does Expo ever plan to support platforms other than iOS and Android? I would love to support the web as a target for Expo. I would love to have progressive web apps being a first-class citizen in the Expo ecosystem. Yeah, I think we're we're constrained by engineer time, not by desire <laughs> or imagination. <laughs> yeah. Universal Windows platform has been requested countless times at this point. That is just something where we're, we're iterating really quickly on our iOS and Android clients, and so it's difficult to take the time to really throw a third one into the mix. But you know, once we once we maybe get a few more engineers on board, we might revisit how what what we're targeting. Yeah, that sounds that sounds awesome. So, given that we see React Native becoming popular on other platforms like iOS and Android, including and including some uh, growth on the web, can we conclude that? React Native is the best paradigm developers have today for creating user, user <laughs> interfaces uh, between declarative rendering and React Native's common UI primitives. Um, That's a bold statement, but... <laughs> well, I'm asking you to make the statement. <laughs> <laughs> Sign on the dotted line, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I like it a lot. I don't know if it's the, the best one. There's still, I mean, for it, there, different apps have different needs, and for some applications, maybe React Native won't, wouldn't be a great fit for the entire thing. I think there are a lot of cases where it does make sense. And I would maybe go as far as to say that for a large portion of apps, React Native may be the best way to build apps. So that might be the most extreme statement that you'll get out of me. <laughs> uh, okay. I, I think that there are a lot of, a lot of good options out there. And I, yeah, personal favorite, of course, being React Native. There, there are just some limitations mm -hmm. currently to the async model that React Native uses for communication across the bridge, things that are related to, for example, gestures, that if mm. 
some of these issues were resolved, um, and there are ongoing efforts to try and come up with better APIs. If these issues were resolved, I, I would be confident saying that it's definitely a contender for most apps as being the best. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, taking a quick look through my phone's home screens, I, I don't see anything which jumps out to me as like, I couldn't build this in React Native, which I think is mm. a pretty good endorsement. Granted, mm, I don't yeah. you know play very many mobile games, so I think that's an area <laughs> where like yeah. an answers for, like, and there's been some interesting work, um, including by one of our teammates. I think there's a lot of promise there, but... You know, most most app categories that I interact with on a day to day basis, I think React Native would be fantastic for them. Hmm. Yeah, and even the even the game case, you could see WebAssembly maybe. Yeah, uh, yeah, and you can see you know using it. There's more interest these days in mixing React Native with existing native iOS and Android applications. I could definitely see like for a game using React Native for menus and for UI elements, and you know using Wasm and GL under the hood. For, for the actual game, right? I, there's a lot of possibilities, but mm -hmm. I think that uh, a phrase that I, I don't remember where I heard this recently, maybe it was at React Conf, but someone described it as a very high ceiling technology hmm. where you get a lot out of the box, yeah. but you can also take it a lot further yeah. than typical cross-platform mobile like toolkits. And my opinion is that that's a very apt description. Uh, people build some pretty impressive mm -hmm. stuff with it. And I think it's very, very powerful when you combine the, the expressivity with the iteration time and the UI performance that you get from using the underlying native primitives. Yeah, I think, Caleb, what you pointed out earlier about you know an advantage with React Native of it always being possible to drop down to native is really important for this kind of discussion because you're really not limited in what you can do with React Native. You can use it for the a single screen in your app, there's some small piece if you find it useful there, or you can use it for your entire app and, and just write wrappers for components that you implement natively as you need it. And so anytime you run up against potentially some limitation of, for example, gestures or, or lists, you can absolutely just write a native wrapper or native view and drop that in. So the flexibility is definitely something that makes it extremely valuable. Hmm. In the future, will React commonly be used without React Native on the web, or do you see a lot of React developers adopting React Native for their web apps? I think for that to happen, I would expect to see a lot more maturity in the compatibility layers that people are building. Mm -hmm. I think there's a tremendous amount of potential and promise there, but my opinion at least is that it's a little early to make conclusive statements about how exactly that's going to play out. I think <laughs> it's really exciting, though. I think it definitely could be that way. Mm -hmm. Well, like, if we say hypothetically, you know, the, the integration is, you know, perfect and up to standards with iOS and Android. Do you think it, the, the idea, at least the concept, is attractive? I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, don't, I don't see why not. I, I'm not going to speak for other people who are picking <laughs> their tools, but I, I think having, having good abstractions for what a UI element is without binding directly to the language used by web browsers could be very powerful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well said. So given that Facebook has a lot of developer mind share with React and now React Native, do you think it makes sense for them to build a React Native Facebook phone? <laughs> <laughs> I think they've, they've tried to build a phone before in the past, haven't they? Oh, have they? I guess I who, who hasn't, really? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, it might make sense. Are they going to do it? Probably not. So, <laughs> yeah. Why not? <laughs> why, why do you think? You know, maybe maybe years down the line. At this point, the the way that I see it is the project is is maturing and growing so rapidly that building a, a, a piece of hardware around it is probably not the greatest decision over this period of time. <laughs> if if the platform stabilizes and I, I guess there is a desire for it at Facebook, then then maybe they I mean they have so many resources. I mean for um, Facebook yeah. specifically, they're not using React Native for the entirety of their mobile application. Right. Right. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I think that like from an incentives perspective, I don't see, I don't see them doing that any, anytime soon. But a fun idea. Are you planning yeah. on building a React Native phone, Caleb? Is no, that, no, is no, that no, what you're asking? No. Scoping out the competitors? Um, no? Okay. Yeah, no. But yeah, no, it's kind of like, I think that's something I'm, uh, at least Christopher Shadow has talked about in the past, where it, it's like the holy grail if you can get the React reconciliation algorithm <laughs> running as low as possible on the device. Mm -hmm. So yeah. It, yeah, it's an interesting. Um, yeah, I think Cheng Lu's talk from yeah. from React Conf last week was uh, kind of related to that. And in, in that Very you have these, stuff. yeah, you have these abstractions, and and you just try and push them deeper and deeper so that you can 
then start concentrating on higher level problems. Mm -hmm. And I think that's related to this is if you can get something like DOM reconciliation or rather virtual DOM reconciliation as just a built-in piece of the platform, then you can stop thinking about what, what library you're using for that and, and whatnot and just continue on. Okay. So besides a phone, <laughs> right? What are what are the other ways Facebook may use React Native to gain a business advantage? That's an excellent question for Facebook, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it could be funny to speculate. I can't, I can't right ahead, anything right. off the top of my head. But, um, I mean, they're already using it as a business advantage in, in the sense that they, they attract, I think, a lot of developers to the company just based off of their reputation for building innovative open source software like, like React Native and React and Jest and Flow and that sort of thing. And, and that's really, I think, a huge point because if a lot of people look at, or rather, if you, if, if you were to look at the current hiring state or, or rather the, the, even the reputation of, of companies currently in the Bay Area, I think Facebook is held in very wide regard because of the work that they do in open source. And mm -hmm. I think even if you look at what Microsoft has done over the last four or five years, or maybe it's even been less than that, where they've been really making a push to release more open source software, and that's improved not only the reputation amongst developers, but it kind of trickles down to non-developers, just the general sentiments towards Microsoft, I think. So I think it couldn't hurt to... to keep doing things that, that demonstrate that you're an innovative, forward-thinking company and mm -hmm. um, kind of creates that, that perception in, I also, in the broader community. I also think that there's something, it, it, would be, it would be irresponsible of me to talk about like the business advantage of React Native without like addressing the, the technical implementation advantages that they get out of it. You know, mm -hmm. they, they're mm -hmm. able to share code across platforms, they're able to iterate on user interface elements more quickly you know, it's not it's not like this technology sure. is purely political. They get actual yeah. real world <laughs> day to day benefit from it. You know, yeah. this is the issue of being so deep in the weeds that I just assume that's uh, like a given. That red, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, this has been a, a a great conversation, Brent and Adam. Thank you so much for joining me on Software Engineering Daily. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah, thank you. Thanks to Symphono for sponsoring Software Engineering Daily. Symphono is a custom engineering shop where senior engineers tackle big tech challenges while learning from each other. Check it out at symphono.com slash sedaily. That's S-Y-M-P-H-O-N-O dot com slash sedaily. Thanks again, Symphono. Wow.